Donna, go ahead. Today is Monday, September 25th, 2017. Uh, my name is Hannah Crawford, and I am the oral historian for the GPI History Project. I'm at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia with Dr. Bill Fagey. Thank you for being here. Um, and we are going to talk about intersections of your career and experience with polio eradication. Well, thank you. I've had the chance to watch the entire polio program from pre-vaccine eras till the point now where we're almost at eradication. And I think the pre-vaccine era is something that most people will no longer relate to because uh, they only know this by history. But we did not really have polio outbreaks until the late 1800s when they started in Scandinavia and then Europe and then in the United States. And people attribute this to the fact that with poor sanitation, a lot of children were exposed to polio viruses in their first year of life when they were still protected by maternal antibody. And then as sanitation improved, there was a delay in exposure to polio virus. And so they no longer had the protection of maternal antibody. And it became known as infantile paralysis. And some people weren't exposed until they were adults, like uh, uh, FDR. And in the 40s and 50s, outbreaks became more and more significant in the United States. And I recall this so vividly, the, the fear that people had every summer. And while they closed swimming pools and movie theaters and so forth, they didn't really know why they were doing this because no one knew how the virus was spreading. And uh, so it was a great day in 1949. I was only 13 years old, and a person who would turn out to be one of my mentors, working in the lab as a virologist, Tom Weller, was able to grow polio virus for the first time. He wasn't trying to grow polio virus. He was trying to grow chickenpox virus. And he had come up with a new uh, medium to try to grow this in. And he filled many vessels with different strains of chickenpox. And he had three left over. And on the spur of the moment, instead of discarding them, he put polio virus into those last three. And over the next weeks, he was surprised that chickenpox did not grow, but polio did grow. Did he choose polio? Was that his plan? No, there's no plan. And he was frank to say this in later years, that he was just a very fortunate person at the right place at the right time. And once they were able to grow it, then they set the stage for Salk and Sabin to grow large enough batches to try for a vaccine. Well, Weller and his two co-workers then got the Nobel Prize, and I didn't know him until years later. I was working for CDC as an EIS officer when I read an article. It was his uh, commencement address to the Harvard Medical School, and it was called Questions of Priority. And the basis of this was, you now have some of the best training in the world, how are you going to use those skills? Will you use them in the places where people really need them? And I liked this so much, I applied to spend a year with him, but I was so dumb, I didn't know he was a Nobel laureate. And I did spend uh, a year with him. Well, within about four years, that was 1949, within four years, Salk had already developed a kill vaccine. He took the virus and he was able to inactivate it and then made a vaccine that, when injected, produced antibodies. Salk did not want to do a field trial. He said he was so confident that his vaccine would work that it would be immoral to have a placebo group. Well, he had a mentor by the name of Tommy Francis. Tommy Francis was a virologist, first person to ever isolate flu virus. And he said to Salk, that's not the way science works. You have to do a field trial. And so Tommy Francis went ahead and did the field trial. An incredible field trial. In two years' time, he em employed hundreds of thousands of volunteers. 
1.8 million children, all before computers. He did this at the University of Michigan, and I'm told that there were file cabinets up and down the halls with these 1.8 million records. And in less than two years, he had an answer. Why did he need such a big study? Because when polio goes around, it infects a lot of people, but very few of them get paralysis. Some people say maybe only one in a thousand actually gets paralysis. So you need a big trial to show a difference in, in paralytic rates. 1.8 million children. Then on April 12th, 1955, he had a press conference at the University of Michigan. And he had famous journalists there like Fred Friendly, Edward R. Murrow, and he came out and in four words, he summarized what he was about to present. Safe, something, and effective. And with those four words, the journalists started jumping out of their seats trying to get to a phone. This was all before cell phones. And uh, it, it included Edward R. Murrow. And he, that night, took Salk to dinner. And he said, young man, today you have lost your anonymity. And then he gave Salk a watch that Salk wore for the rest of his life, and he used to show it proudly that he got this from Edward R. Murrow. Well, this was a high point, of course, scientifically. Um, safe, potent, and effective. That's, those are the four words, <laughs> okay. Uh, so the high point scientifically was that day. No one knew that there was going to be a higher point within a couple of weeks because the day after the announcement, people were so overjoyed, and then they started asking, what's the government going to do about it? Well, the secretary of HEW was Ovita Hobby from Texas, and she had come to Washington saying she would not do anything that assisted socialized medicine. So she had no plan at all for the government to do anything. President Eisenhower told her to come up with a plan fast. So she had a press conference and announced that she would seek an appropriation to buy polio vaccine for poor children. That sounded very good, except Senator Lister Hill then had a press conference and said no American child should have to declare themselves poor in order to be protected. I will seek an appropriation for all children. And that's what he did. Months later, it passed in the Senate. This became the beginning of our immunization program as we have it today, that the federal government actually buys the vaccine for all children in this country. So it was really quite a day because that day, the vaccination status went from protecting individuals to protecting individuals and society. There was now a social contract implied in being covered by this vaccine. And as an aside, Lyndon Johnson used the same reasoning 10 years later to approve funding for the smallpox eradication program in the world that no one should have to declare themselves poor, that we were going to get rid of this in the entire world. Were there any objections to that approach? It, many, uh, there were many objections to the approach because some people did see this as socialized medicine, and it is, <laughs> and, and it's effective, and it's worked all of these years. And so it's one area of our medical practice where we actually have a single-payer system, and it works, and people forget that. I might say as an aside here, that we also have a single-payer system for the military. And people do not think about that. And yet the military is able... See, the people that are opposed to a single-payer system see it as, as socialism and that the marketplace should be in charge. With the military, we have a single-payer system, and then they use the marketplace to provide everything they need. There's no reason we couldn't do the same thing in uh, medicine. So 1955, now we have a, a vaccine. Salk was so happy that we had a field trial because just weeks later, 
we suddenly had what's been called the Cutter Incident, where children who received the vaccine came down with polio. And this began the reputation of the EIS in this country because Alex Langmuir, who had started the EIS five years earlier, overnight developed a polio surveillance system. Only the second national surveillance system that we had for any disease in this country, the first being malaria in 1950 and now polio in 1955. Could you describe that surveillance system? The surveillance system consisted of every child with polio who had received polio vaccine was individually worked up by an EIS officer. These EIS officers were sent out and they would do histories and physicals. They would find out when did they get the vaccine. They would trace the lot number and the maker. And they very quickly were able to show this was due to the Cutter Laboratories in California. And three other manufacturers did not have this problem. If there had not been a field trial, I think you would have to stop the entire program. You couldn't continue it with the other three manufacturers. So the uh, surveillance system then made the reputation of the EIS program. But then Langmuir went a step further. He predicted what the epidemic curve would look like based on how many doses of the vaccine had been given. And then he predicted what the secondary epidemic curve would look like of people who got polio from those people. And he was so close on both counts, it turned out to be part of the important history of CDC establishing themselves as being able to predict what might happen. So this was all in 1955. Within six years, Albert Sabin had developed his own vaccine. It was an oral vaccine. So you gave it on a sugar cube. And the difference between the two vaccines is so the Salk vaccine produces antibodies. A new person will get the disease in their intestine, but the antibodies prevent that virus from going to the nervous system, causing paralysis. With Sabin's vaccine, the immunity was in the intestine itself, and so you could not even have the infection. And so Sabin vaccine by 61, 62 became uh, w widely used in this country. I started the EIS in July of 1962, and I recall vividly, just before we were sent to our assignments at the end of that month, that Alex Langmuir called everybody in to brief them on where we were with polio. And with the Sabin vaccine, he had news that bothered him. He said some people getting the Sabin vaccine have a reversion of the vaccine strain to wild polio, and they get polio. At the time, they didn't know what the risk was, but they were estimating about one case of paralytic polio per million or two million doses of vaccine. So a low risk, but it was there. So we went off then to our assignments. Mine was in Colorado, and in Colorado, we started having Sabin Oral Sundays, SOS Sundays, where we would give uh, Sabin vaccine, sugar cubes. Who received that vaccine? Uh, children, but anyone could receive it. But the vaccine was aimed at, at protecting children because uh, they were the ones at highest risk. Yes, there were a few adults still getting polio, but it was children. And the theory was if you stopped the transmission of the polio virus, you protect the adults also. Do you recall where the children were from? Were they all drawn from certain geographic areas? Were they targeted socioeconomically? Every state had their own program, but in Denver, we had so many sites on Sundays where you could get the Sabin vaccine that people were coming from every place. But you had them uh, so spread out that people did not have to travel far in order to get them. But an interesting thing happened. I was asked to present to the Medical Society, and they thought the risk of paralysis was so low it should not even be mentioned. I was arguing it may be low, but they have to, parents have to know everything we know. We cannot have secrets, because the first time you have a paralytic case and someone who got the vaccine, uh, how do you answer that? But if they know in advance, 
that there's a small risk, then you've already answered it. Well, I was getting no place in my talk to the Medical Society until a man by the name of Gordon Micklejohn, head of internal medicine at the University of Colorado Medical School, stood up and he just said, he's right. We have to be transparent. He had such a good reputation in Colorado, there was no more argument. And that was uh, part then of, uh, of what happened. Did you know him? I did not know him at that time. I certainly did appreciate him. <laughs> but I got to know him quite well after that. Could you talk about him a little bit? Gordon Micklejohn was an interesting, laid-back, quiet man who had such depth that when people got to know him, they absolutely trusted him. And he was one of these people that was not, uh, that did not stay in his office. He was not an ivory tower sort of academic. And in fact, later on, in the 1970s, when I worked in India for smallpox eradication, Gordon Micklejohn came as a volunteer and for three months. And then he went as a volunteer to the smallpox program in Geneva. So he was very much involved in the field work and not just teaching in an academic setting. So now we're up to the uh, uh, early 60s and the Sabin vaccine. Well, during the Salk years, polio decreased dramatically in this country. It was amazing. But then people switched over to oral vaccine because the advantage was seen as this intestinal immunity and stopping the spread of the virus as well as stopping the paralysis. We later learned this is, an, is not all quite as simple as that, and I'll get to, to that in a moment. But people went then to using oral vaccine in this country. So this is the late 60s. We had our last outbreak of polio in this country, 1979, in an Amish community in Pennsylvania. And the, it spread to other states, but it always stayed in the Amish community, which showed that the immunization program had actually provided very good public prevention because it did not get out of the Amish community. But an interesting thing, CDC at that time, for the first time, was able to fingerprint that virus. And so they were able to show that it was the same virus that went to the other states. It was not more uh, two outbreaks or three outbreaks uh, that you couldn't tell the difference. It was one outbreak. Then they were able to show it was a virus that came from a religious community in Canada. And then they were able to show it was a virus that came from a community in the Netherlands. And then they were able to show that that virus went back to the Middle East. And uh, it was such an exciting time. I had no idea what that might mean at the time. If you can fingerprint a virus, are there legal implications if you can prove who you got your disease from? It's turned out not to be that kind of problem, but the classification and identification has become more and more sophisticated. And so it's been, able, it's been possible to track the families of viruses. Has so, that had any political implications? Is that what you mean when you're saying it turned out not to be that kind of problem? Yes, I, I worried about, okay, if um, the Netherlands can say, we got this from such and such a country, they should be paying for this. I wondered if that would happen, but it has not happened. So, so that takes us to the late 70s. A few years later, in the early 80s, and I didn't look up the date of this, but Dr. Macedo, who was head of the Pan American Health Organization, called in a group, and he gave us one day to go through every bit of information that he could gather on polio, and he said, at 4 o'clock, I want you to come back and tell me what I should be doing about polio in this hemisphere. The one thing I do not want, I do not want you to come back and tell me I should eradicate it from this hemisphere. He said, I have no interest in talking about that. I want to know what I need to do to control it. So we went through the day, and what we found is 
with this fingerprinting so sophisticated, we could follow each family of polio viruses and show when they were stopped and how infrequently they came popped up someplace else. And so you knew you had a way of tracking and getting rid of an outbreak, and you knew where to put your resources to stop an outbreak. And we concluded one just has to try to eliminate this virus from the entire hemisphere. When you say we, who else was working with you that day? The, it included Ciro de Quadros, who is a famous uh, vaccinologist from Brazil who worked on both smallpox and on polio and immunizations in general. It included D.A. Henderson, who at that time was now dean of the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. It included myself. It included four or five other people. So it was a small group, and we w really worked hard that day going through the materials. So at 4 o'clock, we have our meeting, and we tell him we've concluded he should try to eliminate the virus from this hemisphere. And he became very upset. He said, that's the one thing I told you not to come back with. And so there was arguments back and forth. I then used an argument not to say we should do this, but to let him know how difficult it would be. And I had no idea what that argument was going to do. I said to him, if you decided to eliminate the virus from this hemisphere, you would have to know that you're in this alone. There is no other WHO regional office that will provide you any support, not even moral support, and that WHO Geneva will say this is an atrocity. You should not have done that. And he said, how soon could I announce it? I had no idea that's the reaction that that would have, but he wanted to go it alone. Where do you think that reaction came from? I do not know where that reaction came from, except that I think he was always thinking ahead and he wanted to do important things and that he was not afraid of standing up to power. And so the idea that he would be standing up to his own boss in Geneva somehow attracted him, but it worked. So he declared, we're going to get rid of polio in this hemisphere, and he did. And much of the work was done by Ciro de Quadros, who was head of, of that program. So that was in the early 80s. Do you mind backing up for just a sure. second? Do you remember any of the details of the back and forth? The, the details are lost in the sense that, that we were trying to convince him this was worth doing, and he was saying, I am not going to do that. That's the one thing I'm not going to do. It's too difficult. And, uh, but it, then this challenge that he would have to do it alone somehow attracted him in a way that I can't quite understand. And uh, Dr. Macedo is still living in Brazil, and it would be worth trying to get an interview with him. His sister used to work at CDC, and uh, so it should be easy to, to uh, track him down. Yeah. I wonder if he would, if he's ever in town visiting. I know that I, there's some travel planned, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what that will look like at this point. So. Well, it's worth trying. It's worth trying. So that was in the early 80s. Then in 1985, when Rotary saw what had happened in this hemisphere, they made a decision to enter the polio eradication field. And a man by the name of Herb Pigman was in charge of this for Rotary. And I had numerous conversations with him. Their aim was to raise $120 million by the year 2005, which would be their centennial. And I remember him calling me and saying, it's going to be done in 10 years. And then he called and he said, money's coming in so fast, we're going to do it in five years. And then he called and said, we've done it. And Rotary really got into this. And so they could be counted on, not just for money, but they have Rotarians around the world who are in positions of power. They're entrepreneurs, they're, they're academics, they're in the, uh, uh, in the sales force. I mean, th these are people worth having on your side when you get to these uh, countries. Then in 19, 
88, March, we had a meeting in Telwar, France, sponsored by the Task Force for, uh, for Child Survival, to look at what's the science that we now have behind polio eradication. And we invited the ministers of health of the biggest countries, so China, Nigeria, India, they were all there. And presentations were made over several days on the science. And the science was pretty convincing, and you could see as we were getting close to the end of this meeting, these ministers thought it's worth doing. And then Herb Pigman got up, and I remember his words as he said to the ministers of health that you are going to meet Rotarians in your country, and they're going to be so invested in this program, you will think that they actually produced the vaccine. He said, be nice to them because they're gonna help you and they will help you with transport and with uh, publicity and with uh, extra support. And so he said, they can help you eradicate this disease. So this is March of 1988. And that meeting ended on a really high point with people excited. There's another aside to this though. In March of 1988? Say it again. In March of 1988. In March of 1980, another side to this. And that is nowadays we talk about the millennial goals in health and, and uh, everyone takes this for granted. That idea started here in Atlanta, 1978, a meeting at Whitehall in Emory, the second day at CDC, where experts from around the country came in to see if we could come up with objectives in health by 1990. And we came up with 220 or so objectives. And then we tracked them over the next 12 years. And in 1990, we had a big meeting to see how have we done. Amazingly, 50% of those objectives had been achieved. 25% had not been achieved, and 25% could not even be measured. <laughs> so it shows how far ahead people were thinking. And so some people see that as a glass half full, and some see it as a glass half empty. But the fact is, it started a process so that every 10 years, this country sets new health objectives and tracks them. And it doesn't matter who's in power, Republicans or Democrats, this continues every 10 years. Well, it was at this March 1988 meeting in Telwar, France, that for the first time, objectives in health for children in the world, were that this was presented, and it was presented by Rafe Henderson, a CDC person who was now head of the vaccine program for WHO. And that led then to the UN doing millennial health goals and, and now sustainable goals. And so all of that started here in Atlanta and then was fueled in uh, March of 1988. Well, these ministers then went home. Two months later, they assembled at the World Health Assembly in Geneva and they voted in to have a polio eradication program for the world. WHO had not been very keen on this because they did not think that they were at a point with immunization that they could take on one more thing. And yet they went along with it. Why did they go along with it? Because Hufton Mahler, who was a visionary leader of WHO for many years, was about to step down and his replacement had now been chosen, Dr. Nakajima from Japan. Now, Dr. Nakajima was not that interested in health, to tell you the truth. He was interested in his own CV and wanted to be head of WHO, and Japan spent heavily to get countries to vote for him. And I never would have believed he was going to be elected, but he was. Well, Hofton Mahler, as head of WHO talked with Jim Grant, who was head of UNICEF, and they talked with Rafe Henderson. Could we take this on? Because if it's to be taken on, it should be done before Nakajima becomes head of WHO because he will not push this at all. And so they went faster than they intended 
made it part of the WHO agenda just to get around that problem. So from May 1988 on, this was the goal, eradication of polio. Looking back, I read, um, maybe it was an obituary of Dr. Nakajima, something like that, but Margaret Chan was quoted as having said that he was a real champion for polio eradication. Had Was that something that happened in retrospect? What's your opinion of that comment? Well, you know, Garrison Keillor said that such nice things are said about people when they die that he's sorry he's going to miss that by just a few days. And that's what happens when people die. You end up putting a better perspective. But uh, he was not for polio eradication. He was not for cooperation with other uh, groups like uh, UNICEF and the World Bank and so forth. And WHO is not the program it should be. And part of it is due to that. But I have to say at the same time, it's not all due to leadership. Uh, we expect things out of WHO. And then you ask yourself, what is it we did to set them up? Well, for one thing, we were trying to protect, protect the Pan American Health Organization. So 70 years ago, the United States insisted on strong regional offices to protect PAHO. This led to regional offices so strong that they can undermine Geneva anytime they want. For example, with Ebola virus in West Africa, you may or may not know that initially the fight was between the African regional office and Geneva on who would be in charge. And so that set things back. The one thing they could agree on was not to invite CDC because they wanted the glory of getting rid of Ebola on their own. Would you say that that um, interfered with in, in responses to Ebola? It, it interfered tremendously. It delayed things. And see, the difference is that when Ebola gets into an urban population, it becomes a different disease, much more difficult to control. All of the experience up until that time had been with Ebola in rural areas and villages and, and so forth. So it did delay things. There's no question about it. So that's one thing, the strong regional offices. The second thing is we um, made a board of directors of all ministers of health. Now, can you imagine any CEO accepting a job where the board of directors is 195 people? And these are people who are in for two or three years. They don't have long-term loyalty to WHO. It's an impossible thing to govern when you have a board that big. The third thing is, we continue to say to WHO every year, reduce your budget. The United States continued to say that also. So we always were putting them on starvation rations. And then we act surprised when they cannot respond to Ebola. I mean, it's it, we put them in an impossible situation. Years ago, when I was president of the American Public Health Association, I think that's when it was, the United States was not actually paying its dues in full to WHO. And I wrote an editorial and I quoted Dolly Parton, who said, you'd be surprised how much it costs to look this cheap. And when Ebola came along, we found out how much it costs to be that cheap. So uh, when I criticize WHO, it's for good reason, but we set up the plan that made that uh, necessary for, for WHO. So now in, in May of 1988, they've accepted the job of eradicating polio. The resolution. The resolution, WHA. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1990 and 1991 and 92, CDC did studies in Sierra Leone, Africa on polio. And we found while the initial decision of WHO to use oral vaccine may have made some sense based on what we knew. That is, it made sense that you want intestinal immunity to try to slow down the spread of the virus. But they never considered using both vaccines simultaneously. Why? And I don't know why except that it had not come up as an idea at that point, 
and people were thinking of cost, and they saw what happened with oral vaccine in the United States, polio disappeared. In this hemisphere, polio disappeared, but we didn't know enough about why. When Sierra Leone, I think we found out why. The virus does well in the US and, and Europe, but when you get into uh, tropical areas, you have other viruses competing in the intestine. So you give the oral vaccine and you don't get as high a take rate under those circumstances as you get here. The CDC studies in Sierra Leone, in fact, showed you would probably have to visit a child 10 times with oral vaccine to get 90% protection against type three polio. Well, it's difficult to get to a child 10 times in the United States. It's impossible to get there 10 times in Africa. Ciro de Quadras was such a driver that he was able to get the Americas to come close to that and get rid of polio in this hemisphere. But now in Africa, it's a different question. Most of the cost of vaccination is in reaching a child, not in the cost of the vaccine itself. So if you're going to go more times, it's gonna cost more money. But the argument kept being, but it costs too much to buy Salk vaccine. And so- And to administer, correct? It, because, pardon me? And to administer the Salk vaccine. Well, it costs nothing to administer it because if you put it in the DTP, now you need no additional storage, you need no additional vials, you need no additional needles and syringes, no additional vaccinators, it's hidden. So the cost is just the vaccine. And yet even at that, people did not want to do that. And part of it was, it looked like too much work to add one more thing. It was hard enough to keep a polio program going. So What's I, your evaluation of that? Well, it, my evaluation is pretty clear. At the beginning, I can understand why oral vaccine was the decision. And based on the example of the United States, that worked. But in retrospect, when you see what happens in developing countries and the vaccine does not work as well. And then we found out from Dr. Jacob John in South India, uh, a pediatrician virologist trained in this country and so good, many places were trying to capture him and no, he wanted to go back to India and he did. And he did studies that showed even with salk vaccine, you get a certain amount of intestinal immunity because he did big studies where he used only salk vaccine and the transmission of the virus went down. So the intestinal immunity was not 100% versus 0%. The take rates were not as great in developing countries. But there's a third thing here that turned out to be very interesting. We make a big thing out of herd immunity. And when I went to uh, India, herd immunity was talked about for smallpox all the time. If you got 80% coverage with vaccine, you could reduce the spread of smallpox. Well, study after study in India showed that when they said they were at 80% and you actually tested, they were probably at 50 or 60% because the vaccinators kept going back to the same places that were easy, schools. And so they would get big numbers on immunization, but they weren't covering more people. The other part of that is, I realized in Bihar, if we got 80% coverage with a vaccine, we would still have more susceptibles per square mile than we would have in Atlanta if we vaccinated no one. And so this is what's misleading about herd immunity. And so now we have polio, and in parts of the world where you have high population density, many children, poor take rates from the vaccine, it's no wonder we were having problems. So in 1991 or 92, there was a meeting in India on polio eradication, and I decided to present the CDC material and suggest that we use both Salk and Sabin vaccine. And my approach to this was, why would you tie one hand behind your back when you have a big job to do? Why not use both vaccines simultaneously? Because CDC found in Sierra Leone that instead of 10 trips to get 90% immunity, 
You could do this in four trips if you use both vaccines together. It just made so much sense. The night before I presented that, Ciro de Quadros told me, if you actually say that tomorrow, you will set polio eradication back by 10 years. And the head of the polio program for WHO, Nick Ward, told me they would not change what they were doing because he said, how can the world trust WHO if we change strategies? I said, how can they trust you if you have the wrong strategy? And so I made it very clear in that speech, this is what we had to do. And WHO made the decision not to change. And only a small number of people were in on that decision, but it was rigid. Ciro de Quadros was one of them. Ciro told me before he died, privately, he said to me, you were right all the time about using inactivated Salk vaccine and Sabin vaccine. But he said, I never could say that publicly because I would be letting down the people who had made the decision, and he was one of them. Who were the other people who made that decision? Uh, Nick Ward, who was head of the polio program, and D.A. Henderson. They were the three key people. There were other people involved, but they all would bend to the will of those three. They were so strong. And uh, so it, it was a good decision originally. This is all an answer to your question of how did I feel. Good decision originally. And then as we got more information, it just did not hold up. In 2001 or 2002, I was working for the Gates Foundation. Could you talk about how you got there? Like, what happened between CDC and Gates? When I left CDC, it was to become the executive director of the Task Force for Child Survival. This was an interesting group because both UNICEF and WHO were doing immunization programs. And WHO had started the EPI, the Expanded Program for Immunization, with Rafe Henderson in charge. And they were really doing a great job of all the technical things, getting vaccine that was good, getting a cold chain that worked, but the coverage was increasing so slowly, it was discouraging. In WHO, there was a feeling of the old horizontal vertical debate where WHO was taking the vertical uh, I mean, the horizontal approach that you have to improve the healthcare systems. And Hofton Mahler was a great believer in that. There was a meeting in Alma-Ata in the Soviet Union, and Health for All by the year 2000 was the, the motto that came out of that. And Mahler was behind that. So he was not for vertical programs. Now, one of the greatest vertical programs was, of course, smallpox, and he supported that uh, completely. I spoke uh, recently in an honorary lecture for D.A. Henderson, who died, to show why he was so successful at WHO. And part of the reason was that D.A. was on CDC's payroll for all 11 years. Hofton Mahler wanted CDC's support. He gave D.A. great latitude. And DA used that latitude. And he was able to pull off a program that I don't think anyone else could have. I mean, he really did a superb uh, job at, uh, at that. So now we have the, the WHO uh, still, despite smallpox, wanting to have the horizontal programs. And then at UNICEF, we get Jim Grant, who's a firebrand. He's a lawyer, and he's so good. He says, let's pick out the three or four most important things and put our money there. And so he's coming up with vertical uh, programs. That's right. And so he came up with what's called GOBI, growth monitor monitoring, oral rehydration, breastfeeding, immunization, those four things. So he and Mahler had problems reconciling this. What did that look like? Were you in the rooms? consistently with both of them together as they were having these discussions? Yes, and now I'll tell you the next part of this story because now uh, Jonas Salk and Robert McNamara have watched what's happened to immunization in this country 
Under President Carter and Califano and Ellen Hinman and Walt Orenstein, uh, Don Millar, our immunization program improved so fast, and they were asking, why can't we do this globally? So they went to uh, Ken Warren at the Rockefeller Foundation, and they decided what they would do is have a meeting at Bellagio, Italy, at the Rockefeller Center, to figure out what to do to speed up immunization in the world. This was before Talwa, correct? This what? This is before France? This is uh, March of 1984, so it's four years before France. And uh, so at this meeting, the convening power it was so great that they got the head of WHO, head of UNICEF, head of World Bank, head of UNDP, head of USAID, uh, McNamara, Jonas Salk. And see, this is a meeting that can only hold 24 people. And so they really got some of the best people you can imagine. Rafe Henderson was there, D.A. Henderson was there, to ask what could we do about immunization. Before that meeting, Jim Grant and Hoften Mahler came to see me alone, just the three of us in the room. And what they said to me, we have such big egos, we sometimes have trouble getting along. <laughs> it's no wonder that our programs have trouble getting along. And so we go into countries and we compete with each other when we don't want to because we have the interest of immunizing children at heart and yet we compete. And so they said, if this Bellagio meeting ends up, as we hope it will, with a task force, would you be the head of that task force? And would you never use the word coordinate? Because no organization wants to be coordinated. Because it's not important enough? They see themselves as the head. And so we started using the word facilitate. And we found out that there was really quite a lot of antagonism between those two organizations, even though they had the same objectives. And we were able, with, month, with meetings every three months for 10 years, we were able to bring up the immunization levels in the world from about 15% to September 30th, 1990, the World Summit for Children at the UN, and Jim Grant got up and announced 80% of children in this world have now received at least one vaccine. He said this is the biggest peacetime endeavor the world has ever seen. And so you see what happened in six years' time because the heads of agencies decided they wanted it to happen. Can you discuss that in fuller detail? I, I, I've heard that one of the, the things that you bring to this work, to global health, is your amazing ability to connect with people, work with people. How did you work with that dynamic of competition? The, the, it would not have worked if the immunization people in UNICEF and WHO had come to say, can you help us work this out? It has to be the heads of the agencies. I mean, that's absolutely crucial because then everyone below has their marching orders. And we're going to, and those two men really did change the way they worked. Uh, Jim Grant came to me one day and said, we need to have some sort of publication that goes to all immunization workers, regardless of who they're working for. Let's them know what are the problems, what's the accomplishment. And he said, if we did this at UNICEF, it would just be one more problem with WHO people. He said, I'll give you $60,000 a year if you do this out of the task force. So the task force never had much money, but people were always trying to give us money to do things. And so we never had to go out to solicit. At that meeting in March of 1984, uh, Robert McNamara said, if we could raise 100 million new dollars for immunization, everything would change. And everyone said to him, there's no way to raise 100 million new dollars because the world would say, well, you have to take it out of something else in health. You can't just add it to what we're doing in health. Two years later, we would not have settled for 100 million new dollars 
Italy alone gave $100 million for immunization in Africa. I mean, think of that. What happened with the task force was people thought there was now a global plan, and there wasn't. I mean, we were just barely hanging on trying to figure out what to do next. But with people now giving money, $100 million from Italy, we had to come up with a plan. And so we continued every three months working at what needs to be solved in order to improve immunizations. Then people wanted to join this small group of, that met every three months, which included uh, WHO, UNICEF, World Bank, UNDP, and the Rockefeller Foundation, five people. And uh, we knew USAID desperately wanted to be in that. Why we, were they not? Because if you let one bilateral in, how can you keep the other bilaterals out? And so Danita and, and, uh, would want to join. Uh, CETA Canada, CETA Sweden, they would want to. And so we had to just draw the line at the people that had started this. But what we did was every 18 months, we had a big meeting where we invited all those people. So we'd have 150, 200 people, and we would meet at different places. And we'd always call it a Bellagio meeting, even though the next one was in Cartagena. And, uh, Colombia, yes. In Colombia. And uh, the president of Colombia was President Betancourt. And he made such a big thing out of the program, the immunization program, that they had immunization days. Rotary was helping to uh, introduce it. And then Betancourt himself would give the signal to open the clinics by giving oral polio vaccine to a child on TV. And, th and this was the opening. Well, I um, was with him in his house as he did that. And afterwards, I said to him, you know, that's pretty dramatic. In the United States, we've only had one president ever give a vaccine. And he was a historian. So he said, let me guess, it was Gerald Ford with flu vaccine. I said, no, it was Thomas Jefferson who in 1804 was able to get vaccine from England from, through a, water, a, a fellow by the name of Waterhouse in Boston, and he went back to Monticello and vaccinated his family, his slaves, neighbors, so he was the first one. And then President Carter went to Columbia and also gave vaccines to become the second U.S. president to uh, to give vaccines. For and, polio? For polio, yes. And so you can see how this whole thing started mushrooming, that country after country now was competing with each other. And now jumping ahead, it was a lot of hard work every three months, you know, trying to figure out what needs to be done next and then holding these meetings. But then September 30th, 1990, the Summit for Children, 71 heads of state gathered at the UN, largest number of heads of state who had ever gathered up to that time, and it was for children. Each head of state was taken to their seat by a child in national dress. Each head of state was given five minutes to describe what they had done to improve child health and what they planned to do. Now, if you can imagine heads of state you have more ego in that room than you'll ever see again. And all but one actually held to the five minutes. I mean, I could not, I was in the room and I watched that. It, it was dramatic. And people started upping the ante as they would hear other people, this is what we're going to do. Okay, we're gonna do this and this and this. And so by the end of the day, you know, it was really a success for child health in the world. And, um, and, and they, they uh, held their egos in check in, in order to have a gl global answer to things. So um, when McNamara asked for $100 million, suddenly money started flowing in. And I tell you, up until September of 1990, this was one of the most exciting programs that you can imagine in global health. What was the impact of suddenly having all of this funding, having resources? 
Well, the impact, we could not have gone from 15% up to 70 or 80% without, that becomes crucial because in many of the developing countries, they simply don't have the resources. We can say, well, it's their responsibility, they should do it. They can't do it. And it's uh, an example of putting the world first rather than your nation first. Um, uh, I'm very bothered by this idea of America first. It's the world first. And if it's good for the world, it's going to be good uh, for America. And I think of Einstein saying, nationalism is an infantile disease. He said, it's the measles of mankind. We've got to think globally and what makes sense for, for everyone. So now we're up to, uh, we have this program. Uh, I have advocated that they use both vaccines. I have been overruled clearly time and time again by WHO. And then in 2001 or 2002, oh, you were asking me how I got to the Gates Foundation. So I, I went from uh, CDC to this task force and CDC, agreed to uh, uh, pay my salary for the first months at the uh, task force. And so it didn't cost the task force any money. I went to the president of Emory, Jim Laney, and I told him about the task force and we're small. Three of us have now formed a 501c3. We have a few other people, but it's very small. Our budget is $500,000. I said, we're so small, we simply can't do things like retirement plans and travel regulations and so forth. Could we purchase this from Emory? And Jim Laney saw the value of this immediately. And uh, he said that he thought we could work it out. But he said, you know, there's a question of overhead. Well, you know about overhead. If you get a grant, sometimes 50% of that goes to, to overhead. So I tightened up as he said overhead. He said, we'll have to charge you overhead. And I asked him how much. He said, would, would 8% sound right? And I said, yes, so fast, so he couldn't change his mind. <laughs> and then what he said was, uh, you'll have to answer to someone then at uh, Emory. And he said, how would it be if uh, you answered to the dean of the medical school? Jim Laney had no idea that I had many years of experience with this dean because he had worked at NIH. He did not like public health. Uh, he always said no first before anything else. And I knew this would be a problem. But I said to Jim Laney, yeah, I guess that could work. But I said, let me give you one other idea first to see whether it would work for you. I said, what would you think if I answered to you if I promise never to bother you? And he looked startled. <laughs> and then he said, okay. So now I'm answering to the president of Emory. We have 8% overhead to do all of our support. And I have access to everybody at Emory because I'm answering to the president. Then. At CDC, the head of CDC um, has now said he'll pay my salary. I have access to everyone at CDC. I mean, it was a perfect situation. And so we got a lot of borrowed, borrowed help. But we also found out that we could do things that other people couldn't. And they were always, people were always coming to us saying, we'll give you money if you'll do this. One example, CDC wanted to assign an epidemiologist for polio to Vietnam at a time when the U.S. did not have diplomatic relationships with Vietnam. And so they couldn't assign someone. So they came to the task force and asked, is there a way you could do that? Well, my deputy, Bill Watson, just loved those kind of questions because he just liked to solve problems. And so what we did was we hired a Frenchman on money we got from WHO we assigned them as a task force to Vietnam on the condition that he answered to CDC for supervision. And, you know, it worked perfectly. We, we were able to solve so many problems like that, we had no trouble getting uh, support. And so by 1990, uh, we've reached that level of... Uh, but then in the 1990s, two things happened. Uh, 
Hofton Mahler retired from WHO and Jim Grant died. The replacements had no interest in this kind of cooperation. So Nakajima uh, at WHO and uh, Jim Grant was replaced by Carol Bellamy and she told her staff immunization is a Jim Grant thing and she reduced the budget. So the 1990s turned out to be very difficult for immunization in the world. And then in the late 1990s, the president of the World Bank said, we've got to solve this. And so he called people together again. And this time, Bill and Melinda Gates got involved and they agreed to put up $750 million for five years to support Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. And the rules were, it would be chaired one year by the head of WHO and the next year by the head of UNICEF and it would go back and forth. Suddenly, UNICEF had to get back into immunizations. I mean, you can't turn down $750 million from the Gates Foundation. And so this brought things back, but now in a way that I think will continue forever. So they put up $750 million and expected others would join in, and they did not. I was at the Gates Foundation by then, and I worried. After four years, Bill and Melinda Gates said, we're going to put up another $750 million for an additional five years. And within a day, Norway said, we'll add $250 million. The UK said, we'll add over a billion dollars. All of a sudden, the matches, because people were not sure the Gates Foundation would stay with us. And once they showed they were in this for the long haul, suddenly they got coverage. And then it was possible to come up with rules on how would countries get vaccines. They have to meet certain criteria. They have to show that they can deliver vaccine. And then under Bill and Melinda Gates, they've now put the uh, more expensive vaccines under Gavi so that poor countries now have access to even the expensive vaccines. See, we have two vaccines against cancer. One is hepatitis against liver cancer, and this is a big cause of death around the world, and the other uh, against human papillomavirus, which leads to carcinoma of the cervix. And so I, I tell you, I am so proud of what they did. I often say to students, when the history of global health is written, we're gonna look back and we're going to realize the tipping point was about the year 2000 and due to the Gates family. They now made global health uh, accessible, important. You could have a track that led to global health. You could have research in global health. And so this has just been one of the best things that has happened. I'm, I'm so proud of, uh, of what they have done. Then I went from the uh, task force to President Carter asked me to be the executive director of the Carter Center. And I told him that my experience was all in global health. I, what do I know about other things? And should I be diluting what I'm doing by getting into other things? He came back the next day and said, would it make a difference if I became interested in global health? And of course it would. And that's why he's done all of these things in global health, the guinea worm eradication, lymphatic filariasis. And so we actually moved the task force office into the Carter Center. There was no daylight between the task force and the Carter Center in those days, because I was head of both of them. And we just continued to do one thing uh, after another. Then the Gates Foundation was developed, and in the late 90s, um, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates asked if I would become a consultant to them. I drove down to Plains and talked to the Carters and asked them, is this a reasonable thing to do? And they said, yes. I mean, you're, they're, they're really going to make a difference in the world, and so uh, be part of it. Now, President Carter did suggest he might be cutting his uh, resources away because I would be afraid to give money to the Carter Center <laughs> or suggest it for the Carter Center. It's all worked out. Did you have any reservations about making that transition? 
I was so, see, if you're in global health, you think like a poor person. You never have the resources you need, and it's always trying to figure out how do you get by, and how do you let all these things go because you don't have money for them. It never occurred to me that a rich person would become interested in global health. Rich people become interested in cancer, in heart disease, and mental illness because someone in their family gets it. Global health, why would they get interested in global health? And so it never dawned on me that that would happen. And then to have the richest person in the world become interested, and then to have him get the second richest person, Warren Buffett, involved. I mean, this is just beyond comprehension. And so it truly is the tipping point for global health. In my day in school, I could not find three people in my medical school with an interest in global health. Now, global health turns out to be one of the most attractive tracks in schools of public health, but in universities in general. And this, I think, is because of the Gates have made it important. And when I'm assuming that you have conversations about this because you talk to lots of people. Um, what is it, as you're rallying the support, what is it that is compelling and makes people care about global health? I think the compelling thing about global health is in the long run, we truly are in this together. And with smallpox eradication, uh, when I was at CDC, you had to justify everything to Congress on the basis of direct health benefits for America. Dave Sensor said the direct health benefit in smallpox is to get rid of it in the world. And so he was willing to put domestic funds into smallpox eradication. That's not something that Congress would approve. I mean, it's unbelievable that Congress did not have the insight to see global health benefits the United States. You can make the case economically that if you have healthy people in other countries, you have better markets. If you have healthy people in other countries, they produce goods at a lower uh, cost that they can sell to you. I mean, there are economic reasons for this, but Congress had trouble seeing it. I remember one a hearing where a congressman was giving me a bad time because of what we were doing with flu and the Soviet Union. You could tell he was opposed to the Soviet Union specifically, but he was opposed to doing anything internationally in health in general. And so he was asking for justification. Why would you do this? And I asked him if he'd had his flu vaccine. And he said, yes, he had. I said, one of the ingredients of the vaccine you received was the Leningrad strain of flu, which the Soviet Union provided to us during the low period of flu in this country, and we were able to incorporate it in the vaccine for the next flu season. I could have left it at that, but I decided to twist the knife just a little bit, and I said, so it means you now have anti-Soviet antibodies running through your bloodstream <laughs> and because of the fact that we work with the Soviet Union. What did he say? He just went off to something else. It, uh... So uh, the, the case for global health has become much stronger. Um, let me go fast forward to this last summer when Rotary had their convention here in Atlanta. Bill Gates came and he spoke to them. He asked me to meet him at the Georgia State Library in the afternoon after he gave his talk, which I did. He had a film crew there and a table with just the two of us to talk about the early days of the Gates Foundation without any format, just talking about it. But he had a pile of books there. That was the one thing on his agenda. Because early on, and I went with the Gates Foundation in 1999. Early on, he asked for some books on global health. And I asked his staff, what, should I choose the two best books or the four best books? They said, we don't know, but don't underestimate him. So I went to his office with other people helping me, and we carried in 83 books. And weeks later, when I saw him, I asked him, have you had a chance to look at any of those books? He said, I've read 17 of them. 
So I asked him, which one is your favorite at this point? And he said, the 1993 World Bank Report on Health. It's one that I have studied carefully at that time. And when he talked about disability adjusted life years, I knew he had actually read that. Because in 1993, the World Bank was able to put suffering and death together in a single number. So now you could actually compare diseases and what it costs to do something about them. You can compare geographic areas, age groups, because you can put suffering and death in a single number. There's still a ways to go to make that more perfect, but it is such a step forward. And with that, you can prove the importance of global health for the United States because you can see what it, for one example, our investment in smallpox eradication is recouped in this country every three months because we don't have to vaccinate. We don't have a person every two months dying because of the vaccine. We don't have the hospitalizations of the people who have reactions to the vaccine. We don't have to do the same sort of foreign quarantine screening. And so we save that money every three months, which means we have just 10 and 20 and 30 times recouped our investment. And that's what would happen if we really did the job on global health. And you can't imagine how much global health has improved. When I started, the world was losing 50,000 children a day under the age of five. And that's down now to a fraction of that. I mean, it's still uh, 30,000, 25,000. And so you can be unhappy with, we still have a long ways to go, but you can be very happy that in one lifetime, it's gone down that fast. And we've gotten rid of smallpox. We've gotten rid of most of polio. Uh, we're now seeing a way to get rid of river blindness or onchocerciasis from West Africa. Lymphatic filariasis is going down, and these are ugly diseases, you know, that it changes how people see themselves. Well, this is all off the track, and so I ended up at the Gates Foundation. But in 2001, 2002, to get back to polio, they asked me if I would revisit this question of Salk and Sabin vaccine. So I came to CDC, and people here, they were in accord we should still be adding Salk vaccine to the program. It's late, it will cost more to get started again with producing the vaccine. But here in the United States, that's all we use is Salk vaccine. We don't use Sabin anymore. And we don't use it because of that risk. So we do have a template for how to make it and, and uh, produce at a certain level. So everyone here said we still have to do that. Plus, you need this at the end of the polio program because there comes a day when you have no more wild polio virus and you can't continue giving oral or some of them will revert. So you've got to stop. But then how do you keep this from coming back in? If you were giving salt vaccine in the DDP, you have an insurance policy. You don't have to do anything. You just drop the oral vaccine. and so. Everyone here agreed. I went to WHO. I had lunch with J.W. Lee, who was head of WHO at that time. He's from South Korea. He had worked in immunization in Asia, so he knew the, the, uh, the problems. And he just immediately agreed, that's the thing to do, it immediately. But he said, how do I do it? I said, you become a dictator. And you say, the new norm for the world is we're going to put Salk vaccine in the DTP, and we're going to continue the oral vaccine as long as we have polio. And as the dictator, you go around and ask rich countries, will they subsidize the poor countries until the poor countries can get this into their budget? He was so excited about it. And by the time I left, we had a, a plan for how he was going to get his own scientific committees to back him up. The polio people were not that happy because it's one more thing that they have to worry about. And I tell you, they were working so hard. And so I left very happy. And what happened, J.W. Lee had a stroke and died, and we were back to ground zero. Now, what did you do? Well, we're, now we're at a point where it, the science has become so clear that uh, they are adding 
the salt vaccine. I should step back just a moment to say, though, that 10 years ago, there was a question of whether we had a different virus in India than elsewhere because they simply couldn't get rid of it. In two places particularly, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, two states that I worked in for smallpox eradication, and they turned out to be the last problems with smallpox, and now here they are, the last problems with polio. And people were worried, uh, this must be a different virus because we cannot stop it. And I said, it's not a different virus. We have all of the problems of crowding, and therefore the herd immunity level has to get so much higher. Number two, you have these children interacting at early ages, spreading uh, that uh, virus. Number three, the take rate is not as great with oral vaccines, so you have to keep going back. So people argued, but the public health infrastructure isn't good enough. And I pointed out how often they were actually getting to children by two years of age. I said, there's no state in the United States that could do that well. This isn't a problem of infrastructure. This is a problem we should be adding the salt vaccine to DTP. But we, we'll get rid of it, I said, even if we don't do that, but it becomes much more difficult. And now India is free of polio virus. So, you know, one thing after another has happened. So where are we at the moment? Well, I went then uh, to WHO. J.W. Lee has a stroke, but little by little, people realize we have to add the salt vaccine, and that's what we're doing. So the, the science has changed. We no longer have type 2 polio in the world, so that was taken out of the, the vaccine, and that's an assist. We have two big problems, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and uh, both of them war areas where the sociology is turning out to be the problem that hinders this. And in Pakistan, it's more than sociology, as you probably know. Our CIA was involved in trying to get uh, DNA using the polio program as a cover to see whether Osama bin Laden was in that house. And the Taliban has now succeeded in killing, I don't know, 60 or more uh, polio vaccinators. That's something I never would have seen 15 years ago. I mean, I would not have even thought about. And it's a tragedy of our time. Do you remember where you were when you heard the news about vaccinators being killed in Pakistan? I don't remember. I just remember it was such a letdown feeling that, uh, see, and this is the other thing. If WHO had in the 90s, decided to put uh, IPV in the DTP and give both vaccines, we would be finished with polio before any of these problems had happened. And so that's part of what drags me down is to see these problems that we shouldn't have had to face, and we do. Now, we're still going to get rid of polio. It's just that it's much, much harder under these conditions. And when we get rid of it, then the question will be, do we keep the Salk vaccine in the DTP? My guess is we will, because it's a relatively cheap insurance policy. This polio virus is in many labs around the world. At some point, the polio virus is going to get out again. And when it does, if we have not kept IPV or Salk vaccine in the DTP, then we have a population susceptible and we've got to start over again. But if we just keep this in, it's a cheap insurance policy that we wouldn't have to do that. It's not going to be able to spread. So uh, we will get rid of polio because there is no real alternative. We can't go back to control. It's, it's too difficult. We have to keep going until uh, we actually get rid of the virus. Dr. Fahey, there are a couple. I wanted to ask you for a little contextual information, and there's actually a lot already out there about your beginnings. Um, but I wanted to see if you would introduce yourself, state where and when you were born, and just share a little bit about your early life. Okay. Um, I was born in Decorah, Iowa, and lived my first 10 years in Iowa in a, a town of 100 people. Uh, so small that when my family moved, the population went down 8%, and um, we moved to the state of Washington. I have just been so fortunate over the years, 
with mentors that uh, everyone needs mentors. And there are studies now that show the best prediction of how people will do after college and university is number one, do they have a mentor? And number two, did they have an experience that's equivalent to an internship where they could use their new knowledge but under supervision? And what surprised me is the majority of people graduating from universities and colleges have not had a mentor. So I tell them it's their job to find a mentor because the people they want to emulate are usually quite busy. They're not looking for mentees. And I tell them, to find someone they really want as a mentor and then ask that person something in that person's field. Go back after several weeks with a follow-up question that shows you really paid attention to what they were saying. And by the time you've gone three times with a question, you have a mentor, whether they want to be or not. They, they're gonna be interested in you. Now, I just fell into this of having good mentors. And so, at the age of 13, I went to a drugstore in a town we had moved to, Colville, Washington, and applied for a job. And I had no idea that the pharmacist had only been in business for a month or so. He was very young and poor, and he was living above the store with his wife and a child. And I walked in and uh, ask if he would have a, a job. And he said he had no interest in having another employee because he couldn't afford one. He had no interest in a teenager, but he thought I was um, handicapped because I had a long leg cast on, I'd broken my leg, and I didn't even think of telling him about that. And he said he could not turn down a handicapped teenager, and he hired me. And weeks later, I walk in the store, my cast is off, and I'm walking normally, and he realizes he's been taken. But it turned out to be such a good relationship that all five of my siblings ended up working for him. And uh, what was important was this was not a town that put great value in education, but here I was introduced to science because you use a metric system in the uh, drugstore. I was interest, I was introduced to magic of things that actually work to, to cure people. And then a, one of the people that came into the fountain every day for coffee was a scientist who did assays from the mines. And he became interested in talking to me and invited me to his house at night to learn logarithms. And suddenly this is a whole new world for me. And I go to school thinking, you know, no one in my class knows powers of 10. And isn't that something that here I have the opportunity? So I became interested in, in science. I went off to college and my biology teacher was a forbidding uh, Germanic person, tall, white, hairy, looked like Einstein. And he would walk into the class lecturing as he walked in. I mean, you had to be listening down the hall to hear him start his lecture. And he was no nonsense. He would come in and he would start writing on the board with both hands simultaneously. Uh, families and phyla and, and things like that. that. And I think I went into biology thinking I'd be able to do that. And of course it, it didn't work that way. But he turned out to be so important because he was well regarded by the medical school at the University of Washington. And when I went in my junior year to say, I think I would like to go into medicine, he said, well, I'm willing to recommend you if you're willing to take a series of tests. And so he gives me IQ tests, the Minnesota multiphasic, things like that. And then when I go back, he said, okay, I'll, I'll support you. And here's what you've got to do. <laughs> and so you get someone like that. He was so um, overwhelming in some ways, but I ended up working as a lab assistant for him. And then pretty soon I'm working on the weekends in a, on his yard. And he and his wife were competing to see if they could bring me food without the other one knowing about it. So cake and ice cream and things. Don't tell Bill, you know, that sort of thing. So I went from there to uh, medical school and I said there were only three people interested in global health. One of them uh, was Ray Ravenhold. 
I should say that the pharmacist that hired me at 13, I kept up with him until uh, some months ago when he died in his 90s, but I would, we would have phone conversations. Then I went off to medical school on Ray Ravenholt. He's in his 90s and I keep up with him by, by phone. Could you talk about him? Tell a few stories about Ray Ravenholt. Ray Ravenholt uh, was part of a large Danish family in uh, Wisconsin. And they lost their farm during the Depression. And he talks about that winter of 1935, 1936, when they lived in the basement of a Danish Lutheran church that had no heat. And the uh, newspapers, if you go back now, you find it was one of the worst winters that the Midwest ever had. It, you know, temperatures of 30 below and 35 below zero. And they were in this church basement without uh, heat. How did they survive? And so you wore a lot of clothes, is what you did. And, uh, and his family turned out to be uh, really a very productive family. One of his brothers ended up as the chief aide to Hubert Humphrey. Uh, one of them, health officer for Reno, uh, Ray Ravenholt, ended up uh, becoming head of population for USAID. And uh, in medical school, I worked for him after school and on Saturdays because he was also the epidemiologist for Seattle King County. He was in the second class of EIS officers at CDC. And he said to me, if you're really interested in global health, you're going to find that there are no good tracks. Everyone has to make it on their own. But the EIS program is the best track because he said you'll be surrounded by people that are interested in global health, not just domestic health, and you'll make contacts for the rest of your life. And so that's what I did, and he was absolutely right. Then as part of EIS, I read this paper by Tom Weller, and I go to uh, Harvard, and Weller becomes a mentor. I mean, I just kept getting good people. Alex Langmuir at uh, CDC, he really was an unusual person. All of these people had very strong personalities. I remember once with Langmuir, where we're talking about a subject and he's presenting his view on it. And I said to him, yeah, but you know, you have to listen to the other side. He slammed his fist down on his desk and he said, there is no other side. <laughs> so these were people of strong opinions. And I often wondered, because I was not the kind to, to argue with that kind of uh, a person, how I was so lucky to get them. They all turned out to be uh, very important. So I've ended up with mentors that are very unusual. When I wanted to get into global health, one of my mentors was a man by the name of Wolfgang Bulle. He was in the Nazi uh, military and he was in medical school. He would spend a uh, quarter in medical school and then he'd be in the armed services. And uh, he became a surgeon went to India, spent 10 years as a surgeon for a church group. And I see him now, in retrospect, as suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, spending his life seeking redemption for having been uh, a German in the Second World War. But he was so important to me because he was willing to support me in, uh, in global health. And you know, I tell students now that uh, I was told to develop a life plan. I said, don't waste your time. You have no idea what life is gonna present, what opportunities will exist. Spend your time on a life philosophy, and then you'll know with each fork in the road what's important to you, that uh, which direction you, you could take. And see, I would never, I went to Africa expecting to spend my life running a medical center there. I didn't expect that the Civil War in Nigeria would drive me out. I didn't expect that during that time I would become so uh, uh, obsessed by smallpox eradication that I couldn't go back to that when the war ended. The war lasted from 67 to 70, so uh, I thought it was gonna be a few weeks and it went on. For, but I couldn't go back now that I was in smallpox eradication. 
If I had not done smallpox eradication, I would not have been asked by Califano to head up CDC. So each time, it was a new opportunity that I could not have predicted. If I'd had a life plan, I, I would have been left far behind uh, in opportunities. I never would have had uh, President and Mrs. Carter as mentors. I never would have had Bill and Melinda Gates as mentors. So uh, I've just been very fortunate. And part of this fortune is there I started at a county level in Seattle, King County. I ended up going to a state, Colorado, and working, then working in national and then in global. I've worked for NGOs. I've worked for global health institutions. I've had an opportunity for experience in a lot of different things. And uh, as I tell people, here I am in my 80s and I can't retire because it's still so exciting. And that's what you want to do is get in a profession that you simply don't want to retire. Was that enough? That's great. <laughs> I have a follow-up question okay. though. So in addition to mentors in your career, who are some of the people that you spent time with growing up? That's a, it's an interesting uh, question. So I grew up in a small, t very small town. Um, and I often tell people that, that before they know I was in a small town that one of the interesting things, uh, one day I realized that I was first in my class in the slow group. And that what's funny about that is there were only three in my class. <laughs> so uh, there's something nice, though, about a one-room schoolhouse. And we all got ahead of our grade level because the teacher would do math for second grade and then give you problems and then do third and fourth, fifth, all the way up through eighth, but you listen to all the rest of it. So by the time you were in third grade, you knew math all the way through eighth grade, it, that type, that was important. But uh, I think some of the real important people in growing up, my oldest sister married a West Point graduate and they were both in high school at the time that uh, they, they met each other. And he was an absolutely straight arrow. I mean, here was a person that fit in so well, but he did not uh, participate in a lot of things. And so he would be the person that would drive people home after a party because he wouldn't drink, that sort of thing. And his discipline and his approach to life turned out to be very important. The pharmacist that uh, hired me at 13 his family became so important. I started babysitting for them. I started spending my evenings at their place after work. I mean, I'd go to school, I'd work, go home and eat, and then go back to their place. And when his wife died, Shirley died, I went to her memorial server, to her funeral, and uh, I said that I didn't realize until later how much I had absorbed from them and it wasn't until I got to college that I realized I wasn't supposed to like Lawrence Welk. But I did because that's what they would be uh, watching. We didn't have television, they did. And uh, so I would watch that. It, I became interested in old cars because of them. And I still have a car that I bought when I was 16 years old, a 1928 Model A Ford. And it's restored. And uh, I didn't know I would become interested in photography and in uh, coin collection. So these turned out to be very important contacts. And then in my work life, uh, this Task Force for Child Survival, I recently did a eulogy for one of the people that worked there, and she repeatedly said after her retirement, she had never worked in a group as inspiring as that one. Everyone had, a, they shared an objective, and they were just good people. And so I see people who are unhappy with their work and I understand you get trapped in that sort of thing. But in global health, you find so many people who are just first class, they have a different view of life. And so I just feel fortunate about the people I've been able to work with. CDC people, you know, uh, this week, uh, or this last week, uh, I had a luncheon at my place because Bill Watson, who was the deputy director at CDC, he was a public health advisor 
And he was so good that they named their group the Watsonian Society when they decided to get together. When he was in his, uh, his final years, some of us used to go to have lunch with him, and it became more and more difficult that he couldn't actually keep up his side of the conversation. So I suggested one day, why don't the seven of us that were doing that go as a group? And then he's just part of the group, and he doesn't have to participate if he doesn't want to. And it turned out to be so good. After he died, which was three and a half years ago, we decided, you know, it's been so much fun to get together and talk about the old days. It's, so we continue doing that every two months that we um, get together and reminisce. So the CDC people, uh, the CDC family turned out to be very important to me. This is kind of a skip um, to a whole new bag of questions, I guess. But I'm interested in smallpox and the transition to polio. Smallpox was the first eradication. Now we're at the we're on the brink of the second in history. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how smallpox is different from polio, but also what has been transferable from smallpox. It's interesting to me that many of the polio people actually worked in the smallpox eradication program. D.A. Henderson and, and uh, Nick Ward and Ciro de Quadros, they were all smallpox people. Uh, you have probably put Walt Ornstein on your list. Yes. And Walt Ornstein reminded me in an email this week, uh, he was intending to be a nephrologist pediatric nephrologist in San Francisco until he came to India and worked in smallpox eradication. And then he spent the rest of his life on vaccines. Uh, so smallpox turned out to be a very important program for getting people into public health and keeping them uh, in public health. The diseases are different. With smallpox, you can easily diagnose a person that's sick because the rash tends to be on their face and on their extremities and they're often very sick also. With polio, uh, 999 out of the 1,000, you don't know that they have polio. It's only the one that's paralyzed that you know. So uh, those are differences. And that makes surveillance different. Surveillance uh, becomes different. But in both cases, it's the surveillance that drives the work. With smallpox, surveillance allowed us to know where to spend our time on vaccinating, vaccinating so that we didn't waste all this time with mass vaccination, vaccinating people who would never be exposed or who weren't going to be exposed for a year or two. And this worked in Africa when we first tried it in December of uh, 1966. And it took us a while to realize it's not just this one outbreak. Maybe we could do more. And so over six months, we identified every outbreak in eastern Nigeria and got rid of it. And that's where the war took place, the Biafra and Nigerian Civil War. So there was never any smallpox in the war area. And then that gradually went uh, to other countries and finally to India, where it almost met its match. Because in India, there was so much smallpox, you wondered if this could work. And it made a certain amount of sense, do mass vaccination because there's just too much smallpox. But, you know, we, it took us about uh, three or four months to perfect the surveillance part of this. We started out just going to villages and uh, asking questions, but we were so surprised in two states alone where we did this in October of 1973 during the low period of transmission, and I was so naive that in instructions, I said, we won't find much smallpox, but we're gonna learn how to do this. In six days time, we found 10,000 new cases that no one knew existed. We were just totally overwhelmed. But it was the surveillance that allowed you to know to where to go for your execution of the program. And so containment then was the second thing. Surveillance with polio, is more difficult, but it still is possible. Do you know how we used to do surveillance early on in polio? We would uh, put cotex into sewer systems 
and then try to detect the virus. And then you just keep going upstream from the positives until you find the case. But you can see how laborious that was and how much work. So surveillance was still possible. And it's absolutely essential now to know where to put your attention with, with, uh, with polio. So those are two different uh, two differences. In both cases, the uh, sociology turns out to be so important. And if you go in with just the science and try to implement that, with smallpox, you had goddesses in both Africa and in India. And for some people, they saw the visitation of smallpox as a positive visitation of the goddess. So how do you get around that? And uh, so in both cases, we had to learn a lot more about the culture. And I have said in a book that I wrote about smallpox eradication, if you tangle with culture, culture always wins. And so you have to figure out what to do specifically there. In both cases, you need constant motivation because we wear down. It becomes so difficult to keep doing the things you have to do every day. And so you need people that, that motivate you to let you know this is the right thing to do and that your times will change. There was a time in India when it was hard to get people from New Delhi to actually go to the monthly meetings in the state because things just kept getting worse every month. And so you were always faced with people who are blaming headquarters for not doing this or that. And I continued going because I said, there's gonna be a day when this turns and everyone's gonna forget their complaints. They're, it's all downhill. And that's exactly uh, what happened. When, when was that day? The day was May of 1975, uh, 1974, sorry when um, the Minister of Health in Bihar had declared we were going to go back to mass vaccination because smallpox was not disappearing in Bihar. There were 31 districts, and he was able to show it's getting worse every month. Of course, the figures were getting worse every month because we were becoming more efficient at finding the cases. But our containment was getting more efficient, and I could already see where the turning point was going to be. And then the bottom drops out when he says we're going to go back to mass vaccination. And I argued with him at his home on Saturday and on Sunday, and he was very polite about everything, but he said, I'm coming to your meeting on Monday to declare this. So all the workers came in on Monday for our monthly meeting, and they began reporting on what they were finding in their districts. And I told them, the minister's gonna to come today and say we're going back to mass vaccination, and I've been unable to change his mind. And about then, he came in with his entourage up to the head table, and he began talking. He thanked people. He said that the work that they've been doing is incredibly good and hard, but for political reasons, he had to go back to mass vaccination. And he said, think of all these young babies that have been born in the last few months who are not protected. They're gonna become more and more of the population. And when smallpox then reaches them, you won't be able to stop it at all. So he said, at the end of this meeting, we're going back to mass vaccination. And there was absolute silence in the room. We knew it was coming, but once he said it, you know, it just took all the wind out of the room. And then a young man stood up and he was so thin and so unsure of himself, as he stood in front of the minister, he was absolutely shaking. And he said to the minister, I don't know much. He said, I'm just a village man. He was a doctor at this point. But he said, I know one thing. When I grew up in the village, if someone's house caught on fire, we all poured water on their house. We didn't run around the village pouring water just every place. He said, if we had done that, pouring water every place, that would be the equivalent of mass vaccination. By concentrating the water on the house that was burning, that is surveillance containment. The minister sat there and looked as if he'd been slapped 
And he just stared and stared and stared. And I had no idea what was going to come next. And then he said, I'll give you one more month. A month later, we were able to show improvement in three of the 31 districts. It's not a lot, but it was enough for him to give us another month. And then the question never came up again. And between May of 74, when we had that meeting, and May of 75, 75, 12 months later, smallpox totally disappeared from India, totally. I don't think there's ever been a more intense time in public health than those 12 months. So that was the tipping point, and then it improved. So we learned a lot about you have to, the local culture has to be involved. And it was that young, shaking man that made all the difference in the world, not us. Other, other, um, other differences um, and, and similarities. The idea of having teams that actually focus on places, the stop uh, program, this has turned out to be very uh, valuable. And the ability to move resources into areas that are still having problems. For instance, now that they're adding IPV, obviously you add it to where you still have smallpox, I mean polio, rather than across the board, because they can't make it fast enough for every place. So you add it to where you have polio. And I think this is one of the lessons. You don't come up with a strategy and just hang on to it. We changed strategy. Uh, well, we kept the strategy, we changed the tactics every month with smallpox eradication, every month. And that's what we're doing uh, with, uh, with polio. Now, it, it won't be the second disease. The second disease eradicated was rinderpest. It wasn't a human disease, but a, a disease of cows. And it's similar to our measles uh, virus, but it kills cows. And so the Fulani tribes in West Africa and the Maasai in East Africa, this was a big thing to them. And uh, rinderpest has been eradicated. I think that guinea worm may be the third disease, and it doesn't uh, use a vaccine. The fourth will be polio. I think the fifth could be measles. The sixth may be onchocerciasis, and the seventh may be lymphatic filariasis. Uh, I had always hoped that I would live long enough to see six diseases disappear. I've seen two, and we're getting close with some of the, with some of the others. It, here's another interesting thing, though. There is not a single pattern that works for disease eradication. Smallpox disappeared because two countries, the U.S. and the USSR, combined forces to drive this through WHO. It was the USSR that started it, not the US. And we finally got together uh, to make that happen. With uh, polio, it's going to be a service club, Rotary, that turns out to be the important driver. And I see the advantage now of an outside group forcing WHO into something. That's what happened. With guinea worm, it's an NGO, the Carter Center, that has driven this. With onchocerciasis, it's a corporation, Merck, that has driven this. With measles, it's going to be the American Red Cross. So each time we use a different pattern, what's similar is we gather a coalition around an outcome, and that's what makes it work. And that's what we're learning about leadership is that leadership doesn't come with a title, head of CDC or head of WHO. It comes with the person that can make a coalition effectively work. And then does that person disappear? That person uh, oftentimes disappears because they are so focused on this one problem. But, uh, but sometimes, I mean, uh, when you see how many people went from smallpox to polio, and then from there into onchocerciasis, um, there is a certain continuity with a certain group of people. I'm very interested in how these partners have worked together. 
you know, everyone has entered kind of at a different time. UNICEF and WHO were very close together um, in timing, I believe. Um, but I'm interested in your personal experience working with when you have encountered Rotary um, and maybe other points of contact, maybe with Gates would be a good, a good place to go to or anything that you think is relevant. The, see, these things turn out to be coalitions. And with the task force, that was a coalition that actually worked because heads of programs wanted it uh, to work. With polio eradication, the leadership has shifted a little bit. It's still a coalition, but I think that Rotary was the impetus to really force this. I think the Gates Foundation uh, rescued it because it was turning out to be more and more expensive. And it's only when the Gates Foundation got involved and said to Rotary, uh, we'll put up this amount of money if you match it. So Rotary's got into this bigger and bigger. $120 million was their original goal, and pretty soon up, they're up to 200 and 300 and 400 and 500 million. I mean, it's really uh, miraculous what has uh, uh, happened with them. So, but getting Gates involved turned out to be very important. And now you have this coalition that really runs the uh, polio program. Which, is, there's another lesson here. WHO, for its faults, uh, would isn't necessary, and if it didn't exist, we always say we'd have to uh, form it. You do need that sort of place. What is the problem is WHO has often not been willing to include other people in things. So, as with Ebola, uh, there was a time when Nakajima became worried that the World Bank was doing too much in health, and he tried to undercut them instead of trying to incorporate them into his coalition. Say, I don't understand that, how you help yourself by undercutting, but that's what happened. So it's the, the, the coalitions that, uh, that end up uh, working in this. I have a question about banks, and um, I've, I'm kind of surprised actually that banks have not become, are not considered part of GPEI. Um, can you speak to that? Why the bank is not? Yeah, uh, World Bank or regional banks or? Well, actually they've been so important. I can remember when the Bank of, the uh, um, American banks, when I went with Ciro de Quadros to see whether they would provide a loan for polio eradication when he was cranking this up in this hemisphere. And we went and had a luncheon with them and they kept saying, we don't loan. Uh, I mean, we don't give grants. And then someone said, you know, we have this category of non-reimbursable loans, which sounds like a grant to me. <laughs> and so that's what they gave Cyril was a non-reimbursable grant. And so the bank did get involved in that. And um, uh, with Jim Kim as president of the World Bank, they have gotten into uh, health programs, but they weren't into polio early on, and so that's why historically uh, they weren't part of this. But you raise another uh, interesting point. Uh, when the Merck uh, Mechtizan program started, the task force and Carter Center got involved in this, uh, John Moores, who was the owner of the San Diego Padres, became interested in uh, river blindness. And as part of what he did, he commissioned a sculpture of a young boy leading an old man with a stick, a blind man, because this is what would happen in Africa in villages close to fast-moving streams. This is where the Samulian fly would reproduce on a fast-moving uh, stream, and then it would transfer Anka Circa from one person to another. And uh, people would go blind by their 40s and 50s in these villages. Many of them had to be abandoned because people would go blind so early. So he commissioned this sculpture. And it was, the first one was placed at the Merck headquarters. 
And I went there for the dedication and spoke. And I said, you know, isn't this interesting? It's the first thing people will see as they come to the headquarters, a sculpture for a drug where Merck is making no money on the human use. They're giving it away free. Now, they made money, of course, on the use for dogs and animals, that it, uh, heart guard that you give dogs once a month. And that's what they use to support the human program. And by this time, Merck has now given over a billion free treatments of mectazan. So I pointed that out, but I also pointed out how rough the man's feet were, and that this was part of the disease, the roughening of the skin and so forth. It turned out the person that made the sculpture was from Alaska, and he was there. And he came and said, I had no idea about that. He said, I did this from a picture, from a photograph. But sure enough, he'd made it so that it looked real. Anyway, John Moores then commissioned a second one, which is at the Carter Center here in Atlanta. He then commissioned a third one, which is in the lobby of the World Bank, a place that said they were not a health program. And here they have that in their lobby. And then he did a fourth one, which is now at WHO headquarters in Geneva. Uh, so the coalition was, uh, uh, it was very interesting. But it's one program that is not led by a global uh, agency because Merck gave the drug and set up a Mectazan expert committee to decide who would get the drug. And I chaired that for 12 years. Uh, he had gone originally to WHO, and he walked away because the bureaucracy became so great. He then went to USAID and asked, if we give you the drug free, would you figure out how to distribute it? And they just said they weren't interested. Which is, I had a chance to ask Peter McPherson years later, who was head of uh, USAID at the time, why didn't you do it? He said, we were too busy. So then... Merck came to the task force and they asked me, if we gave you the drug free, would you figure out how to distribute it? And the first thing I asked him was, how long will you give it free? Well, they decided they, would, they didn't know what else the drug would be good for. But for onchocerciasis, they would give it free for as long as needed, which is, you know, as much as you can ask. And so I was very excited about that. Then I told them about two other problems I had. What are the side effects when you get into millions of people taking this drug? And how do you convince people to take it if they don't see the result for 20 years? These are difficult questions. But I said, we'll, we'll do it. And what we found was that it is probably the safest drug I know of. And so there are side effects problems, but they're so minor that you can handle them. And number two, how do you get people to do this if they don't see the result for 20 years? Well, I ended up feeling so dumb because I lived in West Africa. I lived in a village. I sat around talking to men at night and watched how they scratched. They were scratching because of onchocerciasis. And that this microfilaria crossing the eye that causes blindness also goes all through the body, causing itching. And so for some of these people, the day after they took Mectazan, they had their first itch-free day ever. And you marketing is easy <laughs> when that happens. And so this very quickly spread. We had set a goal of reaching 6 million people in six years. We did it in four years. And then I went back for the 250 millionth treatment in Africa. And now they're over a, a billion. And all of this not run by a global agency. It doesn't come under WHO or UNICEF or the World Bank. It's all private and ad hoc in a way. And it works so well, that, as did the Task Force for Child Survival, that it makes me wonder, why can't we do more of this? And I guess, GP, do, you, do you place GPI in the same class of coalitions? It's a coalition, absolutely. It's still WHO is seen as leading the coalition, but it now includes the Gates Foundation and, and uh, UNICEF and others, yeah. Rotary is, it, it continues to be a big part of it.
One question I, I have about GPI is why there has never been kind of a legal agreement or entity put in place. Um, and I like to think that it's not necessary to do that, that you can do it on good faith and common interest. You can be sure there would be one if it was required. Rafe Henderson has often said about the task force that the WHO lawyers continued to try to find a way to write this up legally, what we were doing, and they couldn't. And so they sort of dropped the idea, and Rafe said, that's what allowed this to work, because we could be a little bit loose. And uh, the best coalitions, I think, are based on faith, that you actually have faith in the other people in the coalition. In that Telwar meeting in March of 1984, we came up with a statement about what things that needed to be done. And each one of the agencies, UNICEF, WHO, UNDP, World Bank, said there is no way we can get this approved by our agency in less than a year. Well, that does no good if you have to wait a year to put that out. So we put it out as a task force statement and the rest of the world assumed WHO and UNICEF had cleared it. We knew they hadn't, <laughs> but we had enough faith in each other that we put it out and didn't say anything. And so it became sort of globally legal. And uh, so if you don't need a legal statement, uh, um, be careful about doing it. And it reminds me of Johnson, the famous uh, fellow from the UK who once was in a group, they were drinking and someone left the room and he said, I don't like to speak poorly about someone behind their back, but I suspect he's a lawyer. The president of Mercedes has just given a talk on what's happening because of computers. And he said, if you're in law school, drop out. There's no future for you. He said, we're going to have a 95% reduction in lawyers because computers are going to be able to provide what most people need, for whether it's wills or, or a contract for a house, and you won't need a lawyer. And so that's an interest. So if you don't need to have a legal document, though, avoid it. I never had a legal document with Emory on their 8% overhead and who I answered to. It was all on just uh, good faith. I think we're coming, at least I don't know how much time you have today. Well, I don't either, but I live day to day hoping I have more time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of polio, do you feel like there are things that we, there's no way to cover everything, especially in one session, um, but is there anything major that you feel like we have left out? In the pre-interview, you referred me to a list of notes you had made, so I'm just stating this for the recording, um, so that we know it's here also. Um, and I think that we covered. I think I covered most of them. Um... Having drawn up this list, I had sort of a chronological list, but what happens is then I get off on a side tangent. Which is great. <laughs> That's what we want. Yeah. And, and then forget where I am, so I could have missed some things because of that. But, uh, you know, this turned out to be a far bigger challenge than any of us could have imagined at the beginning. And part of that is um, that based on our decisions rather than on what should have, what nature did. Nature was tough enough in, in, in this, but then I think we made some bad decisions along the way, and we just could not figure out how to get those reversed. Not including IPV earlier yeah. would be one of them? Absolutely, and at one point, uh, someone raised the question of whether I had a financial interest in Salk vaccine. And it bothered me so much that I dropped out of the discussion for a while. I thought, I've got enough things to do. I'm not going to get into that. But then I kept coming back because 
I could not understand why WHO would not reverse their decision. And, uh, and part of it was this feeling that if they did, they would be saying to the world, we were wrong at the beginning. And, uh, you know, that leads you into a, uh, doubling down rather than correcting. I guess another kind of stray question that I have, too, is um, what it was just to provide context, I guess, to immunization in the late 70s, early 80s, during which time, part of which time you were director of CDC. Um, what the picture looked like in terms of priorities, especially as AIDS emerges, um, whether or not that effect impacted approaches to immunization, resource allocation, like. The immunization program in the United States began improving in 1977 because President and Mrs. Carter, when they got to the White House, invited uh, the former governor of, of, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. That is okay. <laughs> I, you can, do you want to take it? No, we no, it's just I, I it didn't even know I had it on, so. No I'm sorry about that. No worries. Um, but they invited uh, the Bumpers. He was now a senator, and Betty Bumpers and Rosalind Carter had become friends as governor's wives, and they had worked on immunization. And so they had dinner, and the question came up, what could they do about immunization in the country? President Carter called Califano the next morning. Califano called me, and he said, let's set a 90% goal of immunization by uh, school entry. When you heard 90%, did that sound like a really high number to you? It sounded like a very high number because uh, I went to Don Millar, who was head of immunization, and he immediately said, I would not want to see that in my job description. And the next day we put it in his job description. And he rose to the occasion, got to 90%, 91, 92, all the way up to 95. And then we found you actually have to do this by age two for some of the diseases rather than school entry. But we kept improving. Then we asked, could we interrupt measles transmission in this country? And the answer from most people was no. It spreads too uh, rapidly that it's just unbelievable, that virus. If you take a child into a... Um, into a doctor's office with measles, that child leaves, and two hours later, another child comes in, they'll get measles. They've never even seen the, for the case of measles. So it spreads so, it's just like a laser beam. It picks out the people who are susceptible. But we decided we're gonna see if we can get rid of it. And so every week, I devoted 30 minutes where the measles people came in and said, this is what we found this week. Every week there was a new problem. Every week we corrected that problem. And we got to a point finally where we had the first week with no cases of measles. But the last barrier, and this is what I insisted on, was we won't know what the final barriers are unless we choose this as an objective. The last barrier turned out to be we were having about two importations a week of measles from other countries, and we didn't even know it. It was all hidden in what was just happening domestically. And so with that, PAHO improved its program, so we had fewer importations. And now we know that every case of measles is due to an importation from someplace. So we were able to do that. And so immunization became a very important part. What happened with, with AIDS was some people have said the government did not respond well to AIDS. I have a different opinion. I think that uh, the government responded as well to AIDS as it ever did to the Cutter incident or anything else we had. But people who make that accusation are following budget lines. And it takes a few years for something to get into a budget line. But I can tell you is immediately after that uh, MMWR article in 1981, Paul Wiesner, who was head of, of uh, 
sexually transmitted diseases, already have put people out under his money to investigate this. And we continued to draw money from epidemiology from other places. So there was never any slacking, but- Or competition. Yeah, but the people, that's right, or competition with other programs. We put in what needed to be done. Now there was a great controversy at first whether this was due to a virus or whether this was due to uh, using drugs. And what finally clinched this was uh, our second case of AIDS in a uh, hemophiliac. The first one, we couldn't quite be sure because the person had died and so you weren't able to tell whether this was a gay man or not. The second one, this was clearly due to factor eight. And we knew that day we're gonna have problems now with blood transfusions. And so we kept pouring money into trying to answer these questions. And in 1984, before a virus had ever been isolated, the MMWR came up with what we know and how to avoid getting AIDS. And I look back at that, and just on epidemiologic grounds, we knew everything. And we were able to give all of the uh, recommendations that we would give now, even with the virus. And even with the knowledge now. Yeah, yeah. So, but I tell you, it, it was a very worrisome time. And I can remember that uh, in January of 2000, I was now with the Gates Foundation and we had a meeting in Seattle to ask, is there any light at the end of the tunnel in Africa? Because people were dying so fast that teachers were dying faster than you could replace them. Health workers were dying faster than you could replace them. Church workers and so forth. It, it looked so unapproachable. And we came up with six, what we call lights at the end of the tunnel. And we were each asked to go back and uh, try to encourage our foundation to get involved. Gates Foundation had not been involved in AIDS up until then. So uh, I was delegated to uh, present this to Bill Gates. We went to his office and uh, as I've said before, it couldn't have started worse because he was angry about a grant request sent to him and he said, I've told you before, I never want to see something like this again. It's a bottomless pit. If I invest this year, I have to invest for years to come, that you have committed me to something that I cannot withdraw from. And I was thinking, that's about what I'm to ask him. And uh, I was desperately trying to figure out, how do I get away with this? I decided all I can do is tell him. So I told him we had this meeting. We came up with six ideas, and I started through them. I got through five of them, and he said, how much money are you talking about? And I said, maybe 50 million a year for 10 years. That's a half a billion dollars. That's a fair request. And he said, oh, it's gonna take a lot more than that. And that gave me courage to go to number six, which was orphans in Africa. And his response was, you can't worry about AIDS in Africa and not worry about those orphans. So in 20 minutes, when he had started out saying, I never want to see anything like this again, in 20 minutes, he approved all six. And on the way home with his father, I asked his father, can you tell me what happened? And he said, well, we all have our inconsistencies. <laughs> and he said, he knows what he wants, which is a return on his investment. But when faced with the human condition, he'll try to make the right decision. And I've always thought that was one of the best things I ever heard at the Gates Foundation, and it came from Bill Gates Sr. That's great. Um, we're 17 years behind to something that Alan Hinman said on Friday in the oral history interview. And I wanted to get a little bit of your perspective on what it means to set these target dates and then for things to continue after that, how do you view that? With, I often say with smallpox in India, we had these monthly meetings in the endemic states. And each month we would review what the people had found on the ground 
And then we would set targets for where we wanted to be a month later. We never once reached our targets until the last month. And so you have to have targets that would expand what you think might happen in order to keep you inspired to try to do that. And you're much better off failing in the target than not having the target. And as one physicist said, it's much more fun to not catch a big fish than to not catch a small fish. So that's what we do with those targets. We, these are big fish, and, and if you don't make it, uh, say you don't make it, don't come up with excuses. Come up with reasons why you didn't make it, and how will we correct this for the next time around. Have you found that there, there has been a range of responses? Like has anyone responded with disappointment? And how do you, I'm, I'm getting at this other question of how you keep people going for this long. It's been such a feat. Yes, and the um, question you asked yourself, what would it take to keep people going if you did not do polio eradication? If you every year gave polio vaccine and every year had kids getting polio and every year have iron lungs, and then how do you keep people going? And so this is what I mean by a big fish versus a small fish. And, you know, you have to be convinced this is worth doing. Gary Wills wrote a book called Certain Trumpets, and it's a book on leadership. Rafe Henderson, I think, mentioned this. Yes, yes. I referred that book to him. <laughs> and Gary Wills uh, ends up showing that there are lots of different kinds of leadership. But basically, he said you become a leader by having an objective and then you have followers that say, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. And suddenly, um, suddenly you're a, a leader. But that it takes different kinds of leaders to inspire in certain conditions. In his book, for each kind of leadership, he gives two examples of people who are really good at that and an example of someone that wasn't. He has only two living people as examples. One is Andrew Young who he sees not because he was a UN ambassador, but because of the way he provided leadership to the black and white community during the civil rights time. And Ross Perot, who he said was a good business leader, but not a good political uh, leader. And so uh, uh, part of leadership is to continue showing what the objective is and sometimes putting it in new ways that that uh, people say, yeah, it's still possible. And uh, uh, in some ways, the feat will be even greater because the problem was greater than anyone realized at the time they started. In observing polio eradication, mm -hmm. can you think of times when the, the language around polio eradication has changed to keep people going? in terms of communication strategy, or I don't know, wherever else you have seen it? Well, I think this idea of making it a global problem rather than a country problem, and that if we give up now in Pakistan, we have essentially decided we will in the future sometime have problems again in the United States. That's the inevitable result of giving up now. And so, uh, there was a time, I think, when we were focused totally on eradication. Now we have to be focused on, but what happens if we don't get eradication? And that's just not tenable. It's just not tenable. The only way out is through. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> One, I'm thinking of my follow-up questions. Another question, I think we spoke about this in the pre-interview a little bit, was the role of Cuba in establishing um, for PAHO, like this kind of base that eradication is possible or elimination in one country is possible. Um, and I wanted to ask if you re recall Cuba coming into conversation about either eradication, even if not specific to polio. 
Yeah, I do recall it, but I don't know enough of the details. I have been to Cuba, and I've seen their vaccine production and their ability to do things that we were unable to do. Um, you were mentioning AIDS. And before I went to Cuba, I was told over and over, they incarcerate people with AIDS, and that's the way they treat it. I got there and found out that wasn't true at all, that people with AIDS were, in fact, put into a health facility while they were worked up, and then they were discharged to their local physician. And I had, uh, I went for a reception with, there was a person in the Rockefeller Foundation. She married a Cuban, went through medical school, and uh, she had patients in her own practice with AIDS. And so that somehow uh, we were getting the wrong impression in this country about what they were doing. But I ended up very impressed by how Cuba was able to focus on prevention. They were able to focus on things like vaccines and uh, that they had a medical care system that covered everybody. there any, what have we left out? <laughs> I can tell you one of my fears in all these years has been, what if we get a mutation in one of those polio viruses where the vaccine no longer, and so that is my fear every time we have a, a setback, that it's gonna take a little bit longer, a little bit longer, is do we have a risk of a mutation? And. Uh, so that's something we have to keep following. And of course, people are doing that because uh, with every virus that they uh, actually are able to get, they do a full exploration of, of the uh, uh, nucleic acid. And Meaning how long it would take for a mutation to occur? Or? What if it just occurred overnight and now it no longer, it's, the vaccine no longer protects against it? Then where do we, how long would it take us to have to get a new vaccine, and, and uh, so that's been one of my worries. But it is being addressed. It, people are watching for that all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does the, the, do the chances of a mutation occurring, I mean, I guess you say it could happen overnight, mm -hmm. so really it's, yeah. there's, is there anything that would increase that chance? It's been so stable. I think that's the positive news. I mean, we have viruses like flu that change all the time. We have parasites like trypanosomiasis that change just all the time. It's hard to get a reading on the antigens because they are able to, but polio has stayed pretty true uh, for as long as people have been able to study it. So I guess that has been to the advantage yeah, yeah. of the eradication efforts. Yes. Is there anything else you would like to include today? I this is like a it, snapshot <laughs> of... I, I'm sure this was more today. than you uh, expected uh, as it is, but no, I don't think of anything else. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, if there were to be a, an opportunity, would you consider a second interview? Oh, sure, okay. of course, yeah. Great, great. Well, thank you, we'll close there. Thank you okay, so much. thank you.